So is this for college work or what? No, I just like looking at these type of things for like hobby. Really? Yes, ma'am. Good, good history. Yes. Well, it's real. History and geography, that's what I like. I've told classes that don't ever think history is boring. It was your family before you knew them. Mm -hmm. So this is what was happening. Okay. Right here. They lived here. Um, you can see state of Georgia map from 1825. They had already given up all of this land here. They were down into this little territory right here in 1825, the federal government convinced them, you gotta give that up too, we need it, we want that property too. So their chief uh, signed the treaty to give away that land and his people assassinated him for doing that. Are you talking about the, um, what's it called? So you're saying the Indian chief got assassinated for that? Mm -hmm. his, Man. his people assassinated him for doing that. He gave away their home, the last of their homeland. That's they, rough. <laughs> they had to move to Alabama. Yep. Yeah. This is him. And it's odd, that is our mayor's name, William McIntosh. Okay. He was half Scottish. But hmm. the, the Indians didn't mind that. They thought it was a good thing to have a connection. Yeah. But to me, that means split loyalty. This is his house, still standing. That was built in 1823. It's up near Forsyth, Georgia. Okay, so it's still there to this day. It is still there. Mm -hmm. Cool. Built in 1823. That's about, what, three hours and change away? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. These are items straight out of the mounds in Florida. Before the laws came into effect to protect them, they had bulldozers out there ready to wipe them out. And we have a friend, he lives in Enigma now, okay. but he was there in the Navy and went over and got involved. Cool. And saved. Those artifacts. They were doing fine until we came over. <laughs> That's what it seems like. Yes. And then people mm -hmm. unfortunately die off or due to diseases. Yes, yes, they did. Um, you know where this knife came from? Or not really? No. Mm -hmm. Not really. And it's probably not original. Probably not original. So this was the Creek tribe. That was the name of their tribe. Okay. And they lived in the huts like this. They didn't live in teepees here in this area. They could take these apart and reassemble them um, in the next village. They were nomadic. They, once they killed off the animals in one area, they would have to move and set up in another area. Hmm. They were moving all the time. living off of the land, and they knew how to do it. Possibility we had the DeSoto expedition came through here, 1539. This was the route they were taking following the Oak Lockney River that's on the west side of our county. Okay. But we've not had enough artifacts brought in, we wish, to prove it. We've got a glass button right there that an anthropologist said that had to be from a DeSoto expedition. And the little arrowhead was found with the button over near in the Ellington area. Cool. I know. We, we wish it could talk and tell us. Kind of. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 
Uh, this is another fantastic aged uh, item. This was in a field hit with a plow on the west side of the county. The farmer said that what it had formed around rain after rain had turned to powder and poured out. Hmm. So there is no telling us how old that rock is. And then this is petrified wood from the county. Which, which one? All three of those? All just... three of them. Uh -huh. cool. I, I'd have thought they were rocks, but this petrified wood. Yeah, I thought it was rocks too, to be honest. Mm-hmm. You, you know anything about the meteorite? Uh, no. We were said that it was, we were told that it was a meteorite. It fell uh, around somewhere in the Norman Park area. Oh, okay. Now this, the shells were not from the county, but uh, the family that brought them in said that uh, those were dug in Macon on a road, from a road crew over 300 feet below ground level. So that shows you we were ocean. 300 feet deep. Mm. I know, in Macon. Somebody must have had some time on their hands. He was working on, on road crew. Oh. Well. <laughs> So we're, we're fortunate that we have some original uh, pottery pieces. Okay. Isn't that neat? It's really neat. To have original stuff. They were very talented. I heard that they had specific people to do specific jobs. So they kind of got specialized in what they were doing that way. Oh, you gotta see this. This is this is because we were Thomas County at this time. See, 1850. This was in the Thomasville newspaper. This was rewards that was put on their heads if you found a Native American left in the area. What? <laughs> I know. They did not mean for them to stay here on their own land that's what gets me yeah. we had one little girl uh, left behind now the last battle was 1836 now uh, they came across from from uh, the Alabama line you know where they had to they had to move to this was a group coming back across the state they had attacked a fort over south of Columbus. If they hadn't done that, they probably could have come through here without any any harm. Right. But word, because they were scalping and what all at a fort south of Columbus. By the time they reached here, all the militia groups had been called up. And the battle, um, they came through Albany, and they were north of here, out uh, Reed Bingham Park, in that area. And the militia surrounded them. Um, the survivors were rounded up the next morning, marched back through here to put in jail in Thomasville, because we were Thomas County then. And one little girl walked away from the group, and a Williams family took her in. Um, and kept her and we have her story up oh, let's just let you come over here and get it <laughs> <laughs> we this is her story right here see here's your the where they had the, the battle here the vicinity of the park and then this is her story she was the only survivor that stayed here, a family took her in. She was just a child and walked into this yard where the mom was out washing clothes. You know, that's how they used to have to do it, outside <laughs> with the pots. But this is her. Now, she stayed here. Family would not give her up. They say that the government kept insisting. I'm surprised they didn't send troops to take her, but they didn't. 
She married, had six children. These are, let's see, two grandsons. This is his pipe right there. His. And then that's her great grandson. What, at the bottom? The bottom, mm hmm. He had a store in Berlin. Occasionally, people come in that remember him. He he kind of favors this one up here. Oh, so he was around and passed recently. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. This is our most recent story of a actual Native American that got to stay here. Oh, okay. There was a woman that used to live over here in a house. Uh, now she's probably she might have passed away by now, but she was like. Um, one of the descendants. Every now and then we have visitors that say, that sounds familiar like through in my family story. Every now and then. But she was like the only little Indian girl that got to stay here. That was the creek. Now I didn't I didn't realize it, but we had Cherokees up here in this part of the state. Mm -hmm. I only thought we had Creek, but we had the two 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 different tribes. We hadn't even mentioned the Thig Pen Trail. Now they they uh, created that. That was a walking trading path. They built that themselves. That's probably the oldest thing we have left in the county. Oh, uh. This Thig Pen Trail. And that's its story right there. And it is drivable on now or no? It's paved, yep. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's paved. And it does have a little marker out there. That's on the west side of the county. Very historical. Probably the way that most of our pioneers found their way into this area. We wouldn't have had all these roads that we have. So where can I find this headstone at when I get back to the highway? Let's see. I see Georgia 37 here. Oh no, let's come back up here and we'll look at the county map. Let's, let's do that. We took a shortcut to get there. Here it, here it is. This is it right there. Oh well. What highway is that? 202. Is that it way over here? Mm hmm. This is it right there. Mm -hmm. Highway 202. Um, I don't know. You. Okay. You can go through Funston. Which area are you familiar with in the county? Uh, I'm not from here. I'm from Valdosta. You're from Valdosta. Okay. Well, you would be going out that way. Um, You would be going like, I don't know then a town to tell you that would be familiar. You would be going out towards the next county over that way, Mitchell, Mitchell County. Uh, but it is paved, 202. Cool. Might be 202. I might check that out before I head back home. Let me give you a map. Bang. So, to come here. What made it so historical? And now, in the beginning, I think its original name was Pecatonica. But in the uh, 1700s, a body of soldiers was sent down here from the Carolinas to. Uh, wipe out the Spanish that was coming in to the, the country and they found this trail and they came down that trail. That that goes back to the uh, 1700s, 1703, 04. And Mr. James Thigpen was the 
overseer of that project to improve it, to get it ready for the soldiers to come okay. through here. And uh, that's when it got the name got changed to Thick Pen. So it's Thick Pen Trail now. But it was it was about the Spanish coming over. But I I got this this was uh, survived Katrina over in Mississippi, <laughs> so it's it's quite a, a a miracle that it's here. But you can see it it, got, it took a little water damage down there. But I got to looking at this, and I I was kind of surprised at the Spanish influence already throughout our state. Yeah, very surprised. So. The, Spain already thought they owned it, and England thought they owned it. I'm thinking France. France came over and helped to save it from England there during the Revolutionary War. War of 1812, we almost lost. Um, yeah. it's, it's pretty bad. Yeah, I guess Spain thought um, since they got Florida, they might as well take Georgia as well. Mm -hmm. You see the influence already. So, this this was the trip. But see, this was already for the Native Americans. Uh, this is a, a walking trading path that they created for themselves. And then when these this big group of soldiers came through, they followed that trail too and went down to Florida. And that little story tells about the the battle down there, 1700s. So it's, um, to start off with, I thought it was a shame what we did to the to the Native Americans. I, And then you, you got the DeSoto expedition uh, coming through here for uh, Spain. So he was blazing trails. It's all interesting when you, you like history. Yeah. But you think, how many people have sacrificed their lives? It's just... Just for us to live here. Sad. Yeah. Very. And we don't even appreciate it enough. Yeah. And live primitive like this. <laughs> Look how they were making cords and ropes out of the bushes, things, the nature. Right. They knew how to survive, didn't they? There's a lot of things in today's world that we take for granted. Too much. Mm-hmm. I noticed while we were going over here, I noticed that there's some uniforms over there. Oh, yeah. We ran out of space in the real room. Wait till we get to the real room. <laughs> <laughs> so you wanted to see the pioneer era. Okay, here's the beginning, the pioneers, the earliest we saw that came here was 1818. Okay. He's actually one of them that was in the group that came in 1818. What's his name? Roxana? Oh, that wrong Roxana one. Gray. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now he's, he's the guy that came with the 1818 group. Cool. So he was primitive Baptist, bringing in religion. Uh, he helped create about 27 primitive Baptist churches for the, the you know, the pioneers. That was kind of a, the regular style of religion. But now her dad built the Presbyterian church, and its picture is over there. It was built by 1850. Okay. Now, really, it looked like that when they first built it. A storm pulled that roof off in the 30s or 40s, and then they had to put the new roof on. They changed the, the style. So you can't even get a historical marker for it because it's 
been changed. You know, All you right. see how they did a big change difference to it. Yeah, it looked like they remodeled the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I read where um, even though that was the first brick building in the county, it had a dirt floor. Hmm. I couldn't believe it. As progressive and ahead of his time that her dad was, I couldn't believe dirt floor in a brick building. People probably got on their horse and buggy and went out to see it. I heard that the men were paid 10 cents a day to lay the bricks that built it. Mm. Had a dirt floor. <laughs> you probably didn't know how to um, put um, cement or anything down. Nope. It hadn't even come, thought of yet, probably. Um, but now I've I've seen on some of those history channels cement. Yeah. Yeah. This is her class roll from 1861. So she was teaching school there in the in the building. Hmm. So this is how many students they had. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. well, what grade um she was in? They probably taught the whole thing. The whole the whole thing. K through twelve. Mm-hmm. Oh, they didn't go to 12. They, they didn't. got out at, uh, I know my oldest sister graduated 11th grade. Hmm. Yeah. They didn't have 12. They didn't have 12. <clears throat> they just, they decided we need to teach them more. Keep them, <laughs> keep them in school. But you see, they only went to maybe three months. They were working in the fields. They were working. So, her daddy was from Vermont. Her mother was from New York. Now, these were um, really um, uptown people. Um, there were three brothers and a sister came with them. Her, her aunts and uncles and her dad. So, um, her daddy not only had the church, he had a bucket and barrel factory and a wool carding because they were sheep herding okay. that was the first um, occupation here there were so many trees people didn't even want to move here because they didn't know how can you make a living you can't farm and so it took a quite a while to get it um, so this is 1840 This is who the people were that were here 1840. Now this is not Colquitt County yet. We were all Irwin County down to the Florida line in the beginning. Cool. Now this is the first time we hit the census as Colquitt County and that is 1860. We had 1,363 people here at that time, by now. Now we put them in uh, alphabetical order, so visitors can just flip through, you know, real quickly and find their names, whereas in the uh, census, it's a little more difficult. This is the same census, but we put them in alphabetical order. They put them here by address, didn't they? By family. By family? Family group. Mm -hmm. And not in alphabetical order. So you just have to kind of search through it. See, look, see how many Hollands were here. They had big families, and it's kind of easy to to find a family. Idiot. <laughs> oh, I know, they didn't mince words. <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't mince words back then. But you can see where the uh, people were from. That's what makes it interesting, where they came from. Okay. Look at this. This is Bavaria. Uh, wouldn't that be Germany? Bavaria. Oh, that's a country next to Germany, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Richter. That's him right there. He was our first sheriff from Germany. Okay. Then we had a uh, town marshal that was a uh, Russian. Hmm. <laughs> interesting. It, it's kind of, uh, it's just real interesting to see the 
the make where all the, the people were from. Yeah, okay. it is. I'm still trying to find out my own family genealogy. Genealogy. Well, they they've got it available now. Back when I was doing it, it it was not even on the computer yet. Have you done the DNA? Oh, uh, I have. Oh, good, good. And tells you what country to go back to to research. It's so interesting. It is. It's addictive. It is, but it's expensive <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But you love it to know who you are. Yeah. Uh, that makes it that makes it worth it. So this was a, a small beginning, um, uh, pretty limited. Only a thousand three hundred sixty-three people here uh, on that first census. So it was kind of scattered and not very um, industrialized or. Well, her dad had the bucket and barrel factory and the wool carding uh, factory. Um, not many stores downtown yet. It was just mostly a crossroads. We've got a little diagram of it up front, and it was just mainly a crossroads. Nothing, nothing going on too, too big yet. Um, their family, the dad was given land here because he served in the War of 1812. Okay. Now this is the Norman. This one or Park, this one? Both of them. Oh, He's really? a brother. There were seven sons. He had died by the time that picture was made of the six. They were, they were the same family. So their dad gave, was given land here because he served in the War of 1812. That is a piece of handmade fabric. Right here? This one, the little small piece. that We, we were lucky to get that little piece. Handmade uh, and dyed. She did the dye. The lady there under it, she did it. Um, she made the dye and put the threads together. It was an Afghan size and the family began fussing over it so they decided to cut it in pieces. <laughs> It must have been of like um, monetary value or something. Could have been. Could have been. And everybody wanted it. And so they decided to just share it and cut it in pieces. So that's how we wound up with a piece of it. <laughs> but it's Afghan size, the, the fellow that brought it in said originally. Yeah. So they cut it up to share. So sheep herding was the big thing. And they... Um, had too many trees to farm for it to be agriculture yet. So they were they were doing sheep herding here. So that was the beginning. And they they learned how to make the um, fabric and they to sell, you know, and make the wool. Uh, like her dad had the wool carding uh, business and I guess they were selling making making cloth out there at the uh, it was her dad that had the church and it's not on the same property as the church it's one road over this family owned 19,000 acres of land so his factory and business was one road over past the the church okay so any descendants um of her still around here no no, they're, they're all gone. We did know some that were in Valdosta. <laughs> um, no, um, mm -mm. We're, we're out of touch with them. We used to do a living history out there at the church, and we would have family members come, and uh, we knew a, we had met a few of them. Um, one of the uh, Methodist preachers, they were friends with her dad, and um, they shared the church. They would do a Presbyterian service one Sunday, Methodist the next Sunday. Now, that preacher has relatives in Thomasville that I have met because he even still has the same name as the 
the preacher that preached there. Hmm. And I was telling him some of his family history. I ran up with him out at Lowe's, and uh, I was telling him, you need to come out to the church. I take care of your ancestor's grave every now and then. And I said, he is buried out there when he told me his name. So I was amazed. Still has the same name. Probably Man. the fourth by now. Fourth. <laughs> but Thomasville, they're in Thomasville. And I did know one of theirs in Valdosta, but I can't even remember. It was a woman, so she would have a different married name. But uh, interesting, um, her dad, I know, I, I don't know how, but it must have been through his business dealings, but the church was auctioned off at one time because he didn't pay the property taxes, and her husband bought it back so her dad could keep it. <laughs> so, I don't know if he was bad business or what with all of his ventures he did. Seems like it. So he was made a, let's see, we, we were made a county in 1856. Okay. So, so we were off to the war. Oh, this is a post office you got to see. Post office. No locks, no keys. It was just at the general store. I guess people were very more trustworthy back there. Don't you think that, is that that's <laughs> kind of what that, I, I'm kind of interpreting it that way myself. This is the war between the states, era. Do you realize how rewritten this is? Do you? A little bit, not much. It's been rewritten. These men wouldn't recognize what they're accused of today. I've had to do my research because I have to defend Colquitt County Confederates. And I have a neat handout to help. That came uh, with my research that kind of helps explain. Okay. Homework. Homework. So it's for me to look up when I get home. Yeah. Um, you know, slavery was in all 13 original states. Yeah. Okay, you, you got that. Because that's what this is about. Oh, I'll give you this because, even though you know it, because this tells you when the slaves were freed December 18, 1865, after the war, not not by the emancipation. See how rewritten that's been. Mm -hmm. I knew it was I knew it was years, but I didn't know how many years. <laughs> oh, this is another piece that's kind of amazing. That's not talked. This is in the uh, Confederate Constitution that once we seceded and um, began setting up our own laws, this law was put in the Confederate Constitution. No slave ships landing on our ports. They don't, they don't teach you that. So in defense of uh, Southern history, I'll share that. There's so much more that I don't want to overburden you. This, I think, goes back to why Jefferson Davis could not be carried to trial, uh, charged with treason. The Declaration of Independence, if you've ever read it, it tells you whenever any form of government becomes destructive of those ends, is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. Read the Declaration of Independence and it's in there. Not hard to find. The Emancipation Proclamation is another one that has double talk in it. Um, if the federal government was in control of a southern area like New Orleans, it tells you right in the Emancipation Proclamation, this does not apply to that territory. 
slaves are still slaves in federal, federally occupied territories. They kept slaves. It's in the Emancipation Proclamation. They don't teach it the truth. It's sad. <laughs> I know. These men would not recognize what they're being accused of today. These are our casualties from our county. They were fighting for small government. And you will see the uh, Corwin Amendment. Uh, it'll help you. Also, the uh, tariff. This could have been called the Tariff War. This tariff had already almost caused a war in the 1830s, but um, Jackson was the president then, Andrew Jackson, and he worked it out because South Carolina already threatened to secede over this tariff. It had started out like 18% on the dollar. Lincoln campaign to raise it to 47% on the dollar. That's high. <laughs> that was it. That was, that was the problem. And they don't teach you the truth. Um, let's see, I've got a, I've got a sheet here. See, I've been doing this research forever. Like I say, this could have been called the tariff war. There you go. We're on the tariff now. And here's a pretty good explanation about the tariff right there. So it could have been called the war tariff. Uh, uh, you might have heard the abomination. Uh -oh. The war of the... Um, Abomination was uh, in the 1830s, but now I I have the um, book on the Black Confederate. Only seven thousand now, but this is I put tabs on the ones that lost blood or died. Black Confederates. Okay, so they didn't really have a choice whether they want to fight with the Confederates or the Union or not. Yeah. They didn't? Yeah. Yeah. These were armed. Oh, well. You can't force somebody and then give them a rifle and bullets. They were fighting for loyalty to the South. They've got them in here. And you know why? I had somebody ask me, well, why would they fight for the South? Uh, because they don't teach us this either. Lincoln was already planning. He had a colonization plan. And that was to, I think he was against any free labor. This was a Karl Marx idea, Marxism. No free labor. So he was going to get the slaves to foreign countries. Liberia, Cuba, South America. These slaves did not want to leave their country, their home. So they were loyal to the South. They fought for the South. This is a book um, See, I marked the ones that died. This is a POW captured at Fort McHenry. Oh, it's, it's remarkable. I read all about them. And this one surrendered at Appomattox. Some of them were... were um, see, he was captured again. This is another captured. So he was captured and probably killed? Probably, and, and they were held up north in northern prisons. And sometimes they were offered freedom. All they had to do was um, take the oath of allegiance to the U.S. and they refused loyalty to the South, their home. Hmm. It, I know. Um, Sound like more like brainwash to me. No, loyalty. If your family was from the South, you were going to be loyal to them. Mm. Hmm. No, loyal, loyal. No brainwashing. Mm -mm. They were there on their... And they were being paid 
$13 a month, same as Confederate soldiers. This one surrendered at Appomattox, too. Cannon. Cannon crew. He was wounded in battle right here. It was very interesting. I read every one of them. They were doing their part. Hmm. Yeah. And, and what's his book called so I can probably uh, look at it later? Go online. There you go. Go online. Order it. $35. Right. Amazon. It is, oh, even Jefferson Davis's bodyguards in here. Hmm. See, I don't know if I've got them on the right page. Oh, these served with N.B. Forrest. And, you know, they, they preach that Forrest is a bad guy with blacks. He had 75 in his group serving with him, soldiers. Hmm. They were right there, armed. Well, let's see, I don't know. Okay, might have Jefferson Davis's bodyguards right here. Yeah. Here it is. Henry Winfield served as bodyguard to Jeff Davis. Bodyguard. Hmm. Confederate president's bodyguard. I just think it's a shame they don't tell the truth. <laughs> I'm all about the truth. Don't rewrite history. Right. Keep it straight. Keep it honest. I'm all about honesty. Uh, so uh, I think some teachers probably get fired if they try to teach that in school, though. But it's real. I, I know it's real, but you know how and some they died. school systems go. They died. They shed blood. Isn't it awful? They're Very. not told about. I, I read this and it just made me mad. Ugh. Well, these are the books we already had, but this this is a recent discovery. This is by, oh, well, you're going to have to have his name to order it, Ricardo Rodriguez. He was a Marine, and he said, I'm doing this book because no person should be neglected that did their military duty and I agree they put their lives on the line um, there was one prison camp that they would be carried to in Indiana that so many of them died I thought that was really kind of suspicious that so many of them died in that see I've got battle injury marked every one of them if they had a battle injury I said, they deserve this little slip of paper, at least. That's the best. I mean, that's the least I can do for them. And share the story. <clears throat> so, yeah, there's Wounded in Battle right there. Another one. So I tried to at least mark them. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. But um, let's see now. Any other? This is what the state capitol looked like. It wasn't even in Atlanta at this period. It was in Milledgeville. Is that building still up or they tore it down? It is. It's still up there. Can you believe it? Sherman's men didn't tear it down. I did a research on that. Uh, it was a Masonic agreement. They, they went in it. They, uh, they had records and papers knee deep in the building. Hmm. Vandalized, you know. Oh, this is another thing that they don't teach you about. This is the battle flag. Its origin is from Scotland. St. Andrew's Crucifixion. That's the American flag. That's the Confederate flag. Mm -hmm. The Crucifixion Cross, they tilted it. This is St. Andrew's Cross. Uh, mm -hmm. He was a real saint, Scotland's saint. He said, I am not worthy like Jesus to be on the cross. So they tilted his cross. So that is the origin of that flag. They don't teach you that. It's called the St. Andrew's Cross, our Southern Cross. Uh -huh. 
Oh, they tried to relate that to the hate group, you know, the Klan, but we did the research on that. There are two official flags. Have you ever heard? U.S. flag and Christian flag. Hmm. I know. It's on their website. You gotta research it. You can't just you can't just say, Oh, okay, I'll believe you. <laughs> no, I'm actually probably gonna research this when I get home. You are doing the right thing. <laughs> Trying to find out our true history. And you have you have found us today. Jeff Davis bodyguard. Yeah. He had another one. It, it's in one of these other books. Let me see if I've got it here. As to why I have these markers here. But no, I don't think it's there. But we, we wish everyone knew that these Confederate monuments, they're demanding being taken down. Look at how many others, the lives were lost by African Americans. This is just 7,000. There were 50 to 60,000 uh, African American Confederates. Mm. This is just a little portion right here in mm. this book. That's just 7,000 names. In those sources, he went to the National and State Archives and he also used the slave narratives. He got some of his stories from from that. Record, recorded from the 30s, I believe those were taken, uh, recorded all that. Hmm. So, federal troops were in the South for 12 years. Men could not even convene and gather that they were prohibited. But remember, it has been rewritten. Oh, this is Jefferson Davis's foster child right here. Mrs. Davis saw this African American man beating this little child and she convinced him to give him to them and he was with them until the federal troops captured Davis here in Irwinville, just up the road. And they took they took John Limber Jim Limber was his name. Jim Limber Davis. And they never heard from him again. And he was part of their family. Now this is Irwinville. This is where the federal troops captured him. Let's see. And we didn't have invasion here. Um, I don't know how it was in Valdosta. But we didn't have anything of, you know, importance or anything here. So we didn't, we were not invaded and uh, burned and robbed pillaged uh, till the, to the point of nothing to survive on, like most of the towns. Now, now Valdosta, I don't know how they fared. I did read where the women over in Valdosta had to uh, go on a pretty big protest at one time because they had no food and they were starving. Um, I've forgotten the, you know, the whole thing. They might have um, broken into a store. It might have gone that far. Just desperate, you know, for food. Hmm. That was in uh, Valdosta. But not, um, not, I mean, we were, we were losing all of our men, you know. The first group that left from this county made it all the way to the battle at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So we have rocks and sand from that battlefield here. Cool. Now this was a, this was more of a, um, brighter time. This is reaching 1893 with the arrival of the railroad. Now that was a, kind of a far out
probably space age type thing to these people in this time period, you can imagine. <laughs> this, <laughs> this was the family that brought the train. They were originally from New Jersey. And you see any of the big houses here? It's going to be one of theirs. And we also had another family that were the textile industry here. Uh, they, they were, these were kind of like our two royalty families. So the railroad was a lifesaver for the area. Hmm. Now, Valdosta was way ahead of us, you know, with this. But this was 1893. And... Uh, These, this family were millionaires by the 1930s. Um, this, is, this was amazing to me. I found that in a local newspaper, about 14 passenger trains stopping downtown every day. So that was a lot of yeah. going on, quilling and dealing. So you saying the family were millionaires in 1930s money? They were millionaires. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, one of the descendants brought in their records, and um, I, reading, you know, studying through it, I could see that in their their finances and all. Okay. Yeah, they were they were pretty well off. The so keepsakes. Um, we're just we've just been very lucky to be able to have. Some of their, their keepsakes and records. These are even employee cards on their employees. You mean like when they have to clock in and clock out? Yeah, probably so, when they got paid. That was a disaster. Oh, it is? Mm-hmm. Mm. Look, all that's left is the tracks. The wood gave way or something. The water got it. Yeah, that's, that's probably one of the reasons why they built railroads a little bit different today. Mm -hmm. and it's a high quality picture for back then. I know it. Yeah, they were well off. Looks like another disaster there. It was not always roses, was it? Mm -mm. Firewood. He worked with them. His family brought that in. Look at that, even tickets. Boston. Is that Boston, Georgia? Or Boston, Boston, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh. I think the contract they bought was from Boston, Georgia. And then they brought it on up to Pavo and started from Pavo through here. And they even influenced where the marine base is built today in Albany. They had two places to consider building it. One was on the northwest side of Albany, and the other one was over here. And this family convinced them to build it here on this side because they would run free tracks up there to the base, no charge. So hmm. that's why the marine base is setting where it's built today. Okay, because of the railroad. This family. Okay. Uh, they even um, were so influential here until they are why we are known as the Moultrie Packers. You've heard of that? Um, Moultrie Packers. They uh, brought a uh, Swift's packing plant here that employed hundreds of our local families. And so it, they named, they had the mascot, they gave the school so much money until they had the uh, mascot name changed from the Yellow Jackets to the Packers because oh. of this family. Hey, I learned something new today. I'm telling you, they were influential 
They were into all businesses here. Pidcock is their last name. Pidcock. Now he was the only one up there that's not a Pidcock. Uh, he married one of the girls. Okay. He was the last president. But all the rest are Pidcock. P-I-D-C-O-C-K. Okay. And they were the Georgia Northern. Georgia Northern Railroad. So after him, I guess it pretty much fell off? Yeah. He, I think, sold it to the Southern Railway and uh, got it, got rid of the, you know. And since with it being Southern Railway, I don't know what happened to it after then. But um, the tracks have been pulled up, so apparently they closed out, closed it down. I don't know. <clears throat> but he was he was the president when all of, he, he sold it. Is that one of the reasons why I was coming into Moultrie? It looked like there used to be uh, train tracks there and it got pulled up. Mm -hmm. It would be their line. Yep. Hmm. Exactly. You're right. They pulled it up. They had a track laid to go out to uh, Spence Field. And when Spence Field left, the, <clears throat> I don't know who told them, but they had to pull those tracks up and take, move them. But there's no tracks going out there now. Hmm. I think we'll regret it that we pulled the tracks up, but... Who, who knows? Amtrak could, probably could have used it. Mm -hmm. The future, whatever we get. I think we're only the one of the few countries, I guess, in um, the whole world that doesn't use bullet trains still, like that. <laughs> Can't imagine. Too much speed, speed. Okay, the next time period is 1900. Got here. We had many more people would come here and many more businesses. We even had phone service, 1898, downtown. We had our First, uh, real fire truck. This is the the bell off of it right there. Oh, okay. 1915. So things were booming here. They were beginning to clear the land, get the trees cleared, so farming could start. They were turpentining too. That was a huge industry. Hmm. Turpentine. It's been a minute since I heard that word, turpentine. Turpentine, mm-hmm. Oh, let me get this straight so it won't be crooked. This was the city band downtown. Entertainment. We even had a college over in Norman Park. First class graduated in 1903. Uh -huh. This is a diploma from the, the college. This it's all closed down now. Um, it sold the shorter college, empty. Sitting over there, empty. So sad. So the only college y'all have in town now is that Southern Regional? And, um, we have a, um, it's some kind of medical college. They call it PCOM. Okay. Pennsylvania College of Medicine. Medicine. Okay. Yeah, we have that. They have about 50 students and uh, have a neat building. I was hoping they would go, go on out there to the Norman Park College, but they wanted to be on into town near the hospital. Okay. So we're proud to have that. Um, there was a lady in from North Carolina the other weekend. She asked me, well, what, what did I feel was the biggest industry here? And I think it's the health related, anything health related. We've got little spinoffs, you know, something re health related. So we have the chicken factory oh, well. out there, but um, it seems that everything else is kind of left. We had the uh, Riverside Manufacturing, which was the textile business. They closed in 2013. Mm -hmm. Said they couldn't compete with China. 
and they'd been here since like 20, um, I mean, 1911. Oh, wow. Um, privately owned family, local family. So, lost that. So that medical college that's out there, is that um for people to become doctors or is it like all medical field? Uh, it's to become doctors and I've seen things in the paper that seems like it's a variety of things, different different things. Okay. I wish they'd been here when I had my children. I would have sent them out there whether they wanted to be a doctor or not. Yeah, that way they don't have to go off anywhere. <laughs> That's right. My son is in Kennesaw, all the way to Kennesaw. And um, when he's on the job, he would be in Saudi Arabia. He is with, uh, he said they were building towns. He was in India for a while. He was in Argentina. And when the pandemic hit, they sent him home while the flights were still going. And he has been able to stay at home working on the computer with his job over to Saudi Arabia. What does he do now? He's, um, he's, um, like architect, oh, well. drawings, buildings, and all that. Oh, that's all. Yeah, he's that's into, a good living. He's into that. <laughs> he can do that. But he can't spell cat, but he can do math. <laughs> No. That's how it is sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is the 30s. This represents the 30s. Uh, they had cleared the trees. Uh, they were farming. Uh, we had industry here. We even had a Coca-Cola plant here. We were kind of booming. We had that railroad. So many things, businesses would come here, to, you know, to the area. Yeah, that's kind of how Waycross was with the um, railroads and stuff like they're booming real good and then they fell off in like the 80s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, China. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Coca-Cola plant was here and then we had the bottling business. Now we bottled all of these. Um, we didn't make the drinks. Apparently they shipped them here on the trains but it will say on each of these bottles, bottled in Moultrie, they Georgia. Mix in the barrel. So we did, we had a, we had a Coca-Cola plant here, but these were just bottled here. Okay. It was a booming time. It's rare that you see um, sodas and glass anymore. Mm-hmm. To me, it tastes better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In glass, definitely. You don't have to pick up all that aluminum <laughs> when you're drinking it. <laughs> yeah. So this was um, this was really a booming time, I would say. I I think as they were getting the agriculture, they had a, um, a stockyard here for uh, sales. Like every Monday, it was big, um, and we had the. You can see a picture of that Swift's packing plant. This is this is how big that that plant was. That's just a part of the brick right there. It's torn down now. All that's left is a huge wheel out of one of the machines. They have it set up like a little park in memory of all the people that work there. Wait, is that the same Swift that we see the mm -hmm. trucks on riding around today? Mm -hmm. Same Swifts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. They had a they had part of it here. You see how big that building was? Uh, I lived way up in Doran and at night you could hear the whistle to change the shifts all the way from this this plant to where I lived out in the country in Doran. Hmm. It was it was a big operation. So when did they tear that down? Probably about um, 2005. It hadn't been torn down all that long, but it's gone. Hmm. We just are seeing all of our factories go. 
Now the uh, textile one is still standing. They're still hoping for a buyer for it. I, um, I can show you a picture of it in a, another time period. But this is the 30s. We already had men that had served in the Spanish-American War and World War One, And then we pick up with World War Two next. We show you, uh, these are the soldiers from Coplet County that was on Pearl Harbor the day of the attack. We lost two. First two were killed there, Pearl Harbor. We lost 99 men from the county for World War II. Now this is World War I uniform there in the corner. You see how tiny that guy was? We have that on a child's form. He was so tiny. Oh, smaller than me. Small. Mm -hmm. Yet he was I thought I was small. Being a soldier. <laughs> Look how tall you are, though. <laughs> but this is where that book will end up. You were looking at up front. Uh -huh. uh, keepsakes. And lots of sacrifice. It's just so sad. Yeah. classic memory right there, the end of the war. This bomber jacket here belonged to this guy. We have his bombing missions listed here. He flew 63 bombing missions, mostly Italy and France. on the top it says confidential that's confidential now <laughs> but bless his heart he's already passed away he, probably why they released it because it's so old yeah he died in 2006 that's his jacket there Wait, how old was he if he was in the war and he in the, recently if he passed recently he died 2006 I don't know when he was born Oh, it says 1923. Okay. 1923 to 2006. How does how does that make him? Oh, uh, let's see. About 83, 84. Okay. All right. And here's his diary. See, we copied it before it got in the case, so people could still read his diary. So this must be his diary. That's his diary. Mm-hmm. As no, what during the war or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. His daily little, he would jot down a few things while he was away at the war. So Filled. It's just been up in the attic, and I would say, oh no, that's the worst place you could have been keeping your, your things. This is a remarkable piece right here, and I didn't notice it was so crooked, but this is the telegram was sent to his wife. She was in Doran uh, about him being wounded in France. Hmm. I guess he was in on that uh, the D Day, and uh, he was shot in the leg. And he says he crawled to a barn. Uh, people in France, family took care of him until he was able to go back to his group. Then he found out that. He only two of them had survived. Hmm. His 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 name was Pitts, P I T T S. But that was France, so D Day. And we got there to save save them from Germany. It's hard to believe that the Air Force uniforms still look the same after all these years. Isn't it amazing? Yeah, I say that because um, I literally just got out of the Air Force not too long ago, and mm -hmm. I was. Yes, ma'am. <gasps> and I was like, man, the uniforms ain't changed that much at all. Well, maybe it saved us a little money. They yeah. Kept, they kept the same design. <laughs> the fatigues changed up a lot, but not the blues. Not the, and this is the Navy's right here. Look 
third class. I think that's something. Oh. I just had a man in yesterday that survived the uh, explosions that was on the USS Forrestal. Did you hear about when they had the explosions on the Forrestal? Vietnam. Vietnam era. Uh, no, ma'am. This is, oh, this is quite a book. This has our, all of our casualties, the county, all the casualties. And that's World War II casualty. Oh, I thought that say? was their social. I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> what does that say? Vietnam. This okay. is a Vietnam casualty. I was about to say, why would they put their social in there? <laughs> They're dead. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't mean somebody else can use it. <laughs> Sadly. Yeah. I know. I know. My husband's is put out there somewhere. I saw them on one of these sheets. I couldn't believe it. And it killed in action. So this every page represents a life. Mm. I was copying them and I was reading every page and I finally said, Oh, I've got to stop. Stop reading. This is too sad. Yeah. Copied every page to have. Explosion of ship at sea. This is World War Two. He enlisted in Valdosta. Killed in action, Vietnam. Does it say if they were drafted or not? No. Mm -mm. Yeah, of That's rough. I can only imagine them how the families feel. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. Died of wounds in France. That's one. West World War One. Oh, that's why I don't have this information because it's so far back. Uh huh. So far back. Pneumonia. Quite a few from pneumonia in World War One. They didn't know the medication, I guess, back then. Yeah, they use a monster ceiling now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I'm going to stop looking at this. <laughs> I know. See, I copied them all and I was doing the same thing. And I finally said, I've got to quit. This is awful. This is the, the forest stall. See, they, there was a bomb. One of the bombs fell off of one of the planes right there on the deck. And it started a chain reaction. 130... Five of them were killed. Friendly fire. Mm. He was our classmate. Best man at our wedding was killed on the ship. We had a man in here just yesterday that was also on it. He came in and I saw his hat and I said, you were on the forest fall and survived? I said, yeah. Mm. I said, you got to come see. We have a guy here from Doran on display. Um, this, this was also from our hometown, 18-year-old. He was the first one from the county to die in Vietnam. We lost about 33, so we have them, we have them all named in um, stories in this book right there. Mm -hmm. I guess um, this is the, what I saw when I was downtown. Yep. Mm hmm That's why we have that list right there. They were getting them ready to go on that monument downtown with the flame. Oh. Mm hmm Yep. Does that flame still um stay up like that 24-7? 24-7. Mm hmm Our county had three flying tigers uh, during World War II. They are kind of a, a big-name group. Oh, well. Uh, so... We have some of his items right here. The, the, all of this in this area belong to him. Now, he crashed about two times, but actually made it home. 
Now this has something about Valdosta on it. Let me see. Where can I find it? I think they were out of Valdosta. I don't know where I read that, but I had re I related it to this is Valdosta. Huge sacrifice. Yeah. And see, we make this promise. You will never be forgotten. So, I try to remind people, don't forget these guys. Yeah. I mean, that's a sacrifice. That's huge. Yeah. And then we get to the school keepsakes, and we can gloat over this item right here. Moultrie beat Valdosta, 18 to 0, 1928. <laughs> <laughs> that rivalry has gone on for a long time. And then this is 2020. We beat Valdosta, 24 to 10. <laughs> so this, this is... Like Valdosta High School or on Lounge? Oh. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. It just says Valdosta, so. Uh, it might be Valdosta High School, then. Valdosta High School. Yeah. They would have said Lowndes. They would have said Lowndes. I kind of feel like I think it's, it's Valdosta. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's a rivalry that's been going on forever. <laughs> Oh, this is one of our. Now they wouldn't. They wouldn't want you to forget. Look at this. Sixty-one state champion, African American school here. They have quite a football record, and we have one of the helmets there. They were recognized in, in our uh, sports hall thing. The whole school. Mm -hmm. They had quite a football. You know, football is very, very big on the totem pole over in Coquit County. Hmm. She has quite a few fans. She was like a mentor here, and we have lots of people that come through that remember her. Is she still around? No, passed away. No. Her husband had promised to bring her whistle. Now, I've got a picture of her up front. She has her whistle. But she was like a coach. He didn't ever bring it. And so now I'm saying, oh, well, it's probably gone forever. The schools, what the schools look like. Uh, this is from the, the college over in Norman Park. They played the... Uh, University of Cuba, look at that. Cool. In 46. And I said, well, we all let them win, didn't you? They came from so far. And whoever I was saying that to said, no, we beat them. <laughs> Took no pity on them coming <laughs> from so far. So this is the uh, last display room, and we had to give the air base uh, display case. We we got these display cases later and that the military room had already filled up so we put it in here so this is the air base world war ii now you can tell agriculture agriculture caught tobacco tobacco was the king of crops here we had a week long tobacco festival after the buyers came down and bought the crops. So the tobacco was our main crop. You got to get it over here on the sticks. Have you ever seen such? Mm, I haven't seen fresh tobacco before. No. <laughs> that is how it would be cooked straight out of the fields. This is the family planting it. This is a planter. One, one plant at a time. This would be full of water, 
and this would be the plant and you squeeze the handle and it opened up the bottom scoop the dirt back and the plant would drop and the water would drop at the same time and then you had to put the dirt back around the roots so that was the planting uh, procedure it would grow huge and they would pick it as it matured coming from the bottom it would start turning yellow uh -huh. and they would come uh, pick it uh, maybe twice a month and mm. bring it up to the barn on a the procedure would be like this you'd have the green leaves in here and they would bring it up to the barn and the ladies were working at the barn and we would put it on the sticks then after the boys got finished out in the field they would come and hang it in the barns let's see would help you to back of barns and the rafters would be several tiers high mm -hmm. and the oh. boys climbed up and put it on the rafters and then it was cooked then you would put it in the pack house save it a few months until you get through with the entire field and take it off of the sticks and tie it up neatly my daddy didn't want to leave broken on um, crocker sacks and take it to the market and that's when the buyers would come down from the big tobacco smoke cigarette companies and bid on it but this was a huge cash crop here mm. now you seldom see a field of tobacco anywhere they got to adding those chemicals in it and making us die with yeah. those chemicals, you know. Yeah. Okay, now you got to see the, this is the base. The, Do they even make it like that anymore? Like cigarettes and stuff? Mm -hmm. Fresh? Uh-huh. Maybe. I don't know. Because they want those chemicals in it to do your addiction. That nicotine. I don't know if they do it natural or not. I, I have no idea. Hmm. But this is the the air base. Did you come by it on your way in? Mm, no. No. Uh, it's on the Quitman Highway. Um, they use it now for big civic events like the Expo. Have you ever been out to it for the Expo? The Ag Expo? Ag Expo. Mm, no, but I heard oh, about it though. You've heard about it. Well, that's this is what it was this is the water tank is still out there actually and i think the tower we have sent pictures to former guys that used to serve out there and we could tell them these are the two landmarks that are still there but this this was the landing strips you can still see planes landing out there occasionally during the ag expo uh, 6,000 pilots trained out there for World War II. Okay. Uh, the German POWs, 250, arrived 1943. And then they closed it down once the war ended. It was reopened uh, a few years later for this uh, flight training school. These are their yearbooks. These were mostly foreign pilots. We had a volunteer that worked here whose husband was an instructor during this period. He told her they couldn't even speak English. Hmm. But that was very dangerous. Very. How can you teach them how to fly these planes if you can't speak English? Well, I guess they're saying the buttons are the same in the plane. So. <laughs> mesh, mesh that button. <laughs> this is so these are like keepsakes from some of the guys. This is Lieutenant Colonel Scott that was out there. Hmm. Probably telling him how to fly a plane. That's what it <laughs> seems like. Yeah, that's what it seems like. So it's kind of foreign to me. <laughs> <laughs> it would to me. Propeller, throttle, set. Before starting the engine, here you go through these steps. 
That's a lot of steps. Holy cow. Left horizontal stabilizer. Check. <laughs> I remember I watched a video on um, pilots turning on an air aircraft and they were pressing all these buttons before they even started the engine. And I was like, man. It wasn't safe to live here. I've told people that are from here, see I live probably maybe 30 minutes away over in a little town, Doran. Um, I've told people that live here, I, it wasn't safe to live here. There were at least four crashes. We've had people like families now that want to come back occasionally and see where their loved ones crashed. We, we were almost set up to have one come over from Washington State that crashed over in Doran. Mm. Um, and then a brother who was in his 90s broke his hip and they couldn't travel to get over here. But for the 75th anniversary of that accident, we went up and uh, released balloons for them and, you know, tried to make it an anniversary to remind people this was a group of like four planes and they got into the clouds. Their instruments didn't show them whether to go this way or go that way to get out of the clouds. And the first two went that way and just burrowed into the ground. Man. And they started trying to come up and crashed into a, a mound. And I said, what mound in Doran? What? We went out to look and sure enough, there is a mound and it might have been from a railroad that was placed out there joining this local uh, train track that, that was running there. Yeah. So I'm thinking, I'm wondering, is that enough dirt that that guy crashed his plane into and was killed right there? But we went and we tried to make a big, you know, to put the paper and send out to the family to let them know. We did go and, and the guy that was behind it all was born on this pilot's birthday. He was five years old. He remembered him and he had done all this expensive research and sent the records over here to, to help. But it, it became kind of like a personal family member to us, but we never got to meet him because the brother to the pilot broke his hip and this nephew couldn't couldn't bring him over here and they were gonna go over there and see where the plane crashed. Hmm. They had that they had that research done so well. It, it was a sad they didn't get to come. But I wonder we, how much it cost. <laughs> we had uh, President Eisenhower landed out here five or six times. Okay. Uh, he was going for hunting trips get away down in Thomasville on the uh, bird reservation or preservations down there. So he would come here. His plane, the regular little airport here couldn't handle his big plane so he could land it out there at Spencefield. Oh, you mean like the, um, the Air Force one back then couldn't mm -hmm. handle it? Too huge, yeah. Our regular little uh, airport couldn't handle yeah big plane. I remember when I was stationed in Virginia the way they do it is uh, if the president landed on the base they had to lock the whole base down and nobody could go outside or anything like that. It was safer wasn't it? Yes. It was safer. I don't right. know if they did that back then though. I'm, I'm pretty sure they did. Uh, we have a the highway he would take goes by one of our elementary schools and people that were in elementary school still remember today that their teachers would line them up by the highway so they could wave at him. But can you imagine them doing that today? That wouldn't happen. Because mm -hmm. they're out by highway at 319. <laughs> but they remember, they have that memory. Of, that they were out there to wave at President Eisenhower <laughs> Elementary School. <laughs> But that base put us on the national level when we had that air base here. That was a big, 
it was a big thing for this town. Look at the, see the, um, the cadets that were out there. That's downtown in a parade, participating in a, in one of the parades downtown. Oh, really? So it made it, it turned this into a big place. When you have 6,000 pilots out there training, and now it's just a ag expo. <laughs> But we do have people that still write and question us. We have we heard from one guy that told me his his dad was out there, stationed out there, so let's see, his mom came over here, they were from Oklahoma, and he said, and I can brag because I was the first Native American born on Spenceville. Yeah. Spenceville property. So I looked, he wanted uh, some of the research on his dad, and I looked him up and found him. He was one of the uh, MPs out there. Cool. And he did have an Indian name. I, can't, I would never remember it, but it was, it was quite obvious that he, he was a Native American last name. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. First Native American born on the air base. Uh, 1928 Chevrolet. This this shows you how we got it in the building. This is the guy that donated it. His dad had a um, car business downtown this is this is him uh -huh. that was his dad they opened their business here in 1939 now this is a 28 brought in on the trade-in so he he gave it away this is how we got it in the, the back doors up there on a flatbed coming in unloading and squeezing it through those two doors over there uh, got motion, motion detectors. There we there go. There you go. Got it. So we're getting it back in the building into that room there, and it, there he is posing with it. Uh, and then they pulled it front wise in here, coming through those wooden doors there. <laughs> so you're saying down that whole car fit in here and then y'all turned it around and put it there? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Backed it up and put it over here. Yep. Cool. Came through those two doors right there. That one will open. And Oh, and that's his entire family. Okay. He said it came in on a trade back in the early days and he just, just fell in love with it and kept it all these years. And he didn't want his grandson to inherit it and turn it into a hot rod. <laughs> oh. so, that was his fear. Did not want it to be turned into a hot rod. 